Thanks, everyone. I'm Lynn Clark, and I'm going to be talking about making front-end modules actually work with Webpack and Browserify. So since this is a node-focused group, how many of you, I want to ask first, how many of you are familiar with these two tools? For those of you who aren't, as a, I'm actually impressed, um, but those, for those of you who aren't, um, I'll just give a brief intro. These tools, they basically do the same thing. Um, they make it possible for you to use modules, like the modules you download from NPM, in the browser and bundle those up into something that you can use on your web pages. But before I talk about these, because I'm going to talk about how you can actually use these tools, but before I do, I feel like I need to address something. And that something is module shaming. When you talk about modularity in front-end communities, particularly when you use a word like small modules, you can strike fear into your audience's heart that you're going to start wagging your finger at them and say, you're doing it wrong. You don't understand how modularity works. And this fear is not unfounded. I actually ran into a really good example of it just in doing the research for this talk. It was from a discussion about Browserify and Webpack comparing these two. And so I wanted to share that today. After reading all the comments here, I'm pretty convinced that none of the Webpack people know what modular means. And this was my reaction to that comment. Now, I'm not going to name the person who said this because I know them and I like them personally, and I think that there's a good chance that they didn't mean it the way that it comes across. But it is a pretty succinct example of an attitude that I've seen and that I've seen people take pretty seriously, and I think it's worth addressing that attitude and that perspective. So first, let's talk about when he says modular, what kind of modularity are we talking about here? Right after that comment, somebody else clarified. The problem is that they're all, they're all delivered as a single package. And so this is a, a perspective I've seen. This is a definition I've seen used a lot by evangelists who are kind of talking about this same philosophy. You know, that there has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between GitHub packages and NPM, GitHub repos and NPM packages. The problem is that they're not labeled for individual sale. Now, I've been studying and talking about modularity for a number of years now, uh, both when I worked at NPM, but also before that, when I was working at a research institute that dealt with things like distributed extensibility-related concepts, and also working across different open source projects in different languages. And I can tell you, having been exposed to modularity in these different contexts, that this is not a canonical definition of modularity. It's a definition that's evolved in a community of practice. And that's not unusual, you know, when you start working together, you start developing connotations around the words that you're using to communicate about your shared problems. So that's not a problem. But what is a problem is that when we take these evolved definitions and we take them to other communities and we treat them as though they're canonical definitions or universal definitions. And it's especially a problem when we start using them as cudgels to whack people over the head with when they disagree with us. If you look at the early writings about modularity, it wasn't about reusability. The problem that, you know, I'm talking about the 1960s when we were moving from a pre-modular era of computer science from ENIAC to IBM standard modular system. The problems that early computer scientists saw modularity addressing was that you had these large problems. How do you break those up into smaller problems that you can fit in your head all at once? It was really a matter of cognitive science. The idea that reusability is a requirement for modularity isn't one that I've seen too much in these writings and, and in other communities. I mean, even if you look at the Unix rules, the rule of modularity doesn't talk about reusability. It talks about readability. It talks about the same thing, about being able to fit everything in your head at once so that you can debug it more easily. Rather than as a requirement for something to be modular, I've often seen reusability described as a benefit of modularity. Once you've modularized something, once you've actually established these boundaries, then you can package it up and move it off so it can be used in a different system. But that's not usually the criteria you use to judge whether or not something's modular. The criteria that I've often seen used are cohesion and coupling. So I'll explain what these two mean. Cohesion is the degree to which elements of a module belong together. 
And the degree to which the things that belong together are in the same module. So an example of this, a really easy example of it, are setters and getters. If you have a setter on a piece of data and a getter on a piece of data, those should go together. That's a trivial example, but I think it, it's a good one. The other criteria, besides cohesion, is coupling. Coupling is the degree of interdependence between modules. When you have tightly coupled modules, they all poke at each other's internals. They set state on each other. Or there might be a global object that they're all manipulating. The problem with this is that whenever you're working on this module that you have in your brain, you also have to have a mental picture of what's going on over here, because that can be affecting what's going on in this module. It could be poking and prodding and changing what's going on. So what you want is loose coupling, so that you can focus on the one in your brain and not have to worry about the module that's over here. And you can reduce coupling by creating interfaces, by passing things into a caller or callee and having that callee pass something back out as a return value. So when I talk about modularity, these are the criteria that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about high cohesion and loose coupling. I'll also talk about how when you reduce coupling, you do make it possible to potentially extract something, take it out, and reuse it elsewhere. But since that's not a criteria for judging whether or not something's modular, there's not going to be any module shaming in this talk. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the problem that both of these things solve. So the problem that both of these tools address is how you bundle up modules, how you take a dependency tree like this and output it to a single JavaScript file that you can include in a script tag in your page. But that's still pretty abstract, so I want to make sure this is concrete. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about here. I want you to think back to a time when jQuery was the library du jour and how all of your clients, remember all of your clients wanted those tool tips because that was like how you made your site look hip and current? Do people remember this? OK, good. Now, here's the code to add that tooltip. You know, you use jQuery, you get all of the elements that have that class on them, and you call the tipso function. I'm using a plugin called tipso. You call the tipso function on all those elements. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. This code actually won't work. And does anybody have any ideas why that might be? You can shout it out. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Correct. We don't have the script tag for jQuery or for Tipso. So we add those script tags. Now it works. What are these script tags doing here? They're giving your app a way to tell the browser, hey, before you load my code, you need to load jQuery and you need to load Tipso. They're giving your app a way to make its dependencies explicit. So if all we're doing is making dependencies explicit, I should be able to switch these around and have Tipso up top and jQuery underneath, right? OK, yeah, I see some people shaking their heads. This will break everything. And that is because not only does your app have a dependency on jQuery and a dependency on Tipso, but Tipso also has an implicit dependency on jQuery. And when you're using script tags, you don't have a way to make this implicit dependency explicit. You don't have a way. I mean, ordering's not really a good way of doing that. Um, and not only do you not have a way in script tags to do that, you really don't want to do that in your application. You don't want your application, you know, if we're talking about cohesion here, that's information that Tipso should be providing. So that's what these tools make it possible for you to do. They make it possible for you to make your dependencies explicit and to express a dependency graph for things like Tipso to express their own dependencies. So now we've talked about the theory of what these tools do. Let's talk about the practice. Let's talk about the basics of bundling. In both Webpack and Browserify, you have a concept of an entry point, which is the root of your dependency tree. And then you have the output, which is the JavaScript file that you output to. In Webpack, you usually would use a Webpack config file. You specify your entry. And your output, you specify as an object. You want to have a path there, because Webpack can handle um, non-JS assets. And it will put them in that directory. And then, of course, with Browserify, I, with Webpack, you can use the command line. You don't have to. Most people use a config file. With Browserify, you usually use the, uh, the command line for this. But what about the case where what you, are, what you have in your source, what you have in your tree, 
doesn't actually match what you want to have in your file, where you have something like JSX or ES6, or if you have CoffeeScript. Then you need to transpile. So for Webpack, you use these things called loaders to transpile. You have an array of loaders, and you provide a test. You say that for anything that has this certain file extension, apply this loader to make sure it gets transpiled in the correct way. Browserify has a similar concept to loaders, which are transforms. And so you can uh, specify those with a flag. So I would say dash T Babelify to apply Babel as my transpiler. Now, I said these two were similar. I do want to clarify that, though. I want to qualify it, um, because this is a point of controversy between the two communities. Browserify folks will often look at the concept of loaders and point to it and say, this is a case where Webpack is not modular. And the reason for that is that loaders are specified at the root of the application tree. You specify what loaders get used for your application up there at the top. And these apply, by default, to your entire tree. But what if there's a package at the a lower part of the tree? You know, having the application's loaders apply to that, it kind of does seem like it's breaking that cohesion thing that we were talking about. You know, that information doesn't belong up there at the tree, top of the tree. It belongs down there in that package. And so that's what Browserify actually gives you the capability to do. You can specify transforms in package.json files. So when I started doing my research for this talk, I was actually in Team Browserify. I thought this was not a modular way to do it. But then I started learning about some of the other things you can do with Webpack to kind of mitigate this problem. So one thing you can do is you can specify that only certain parts of the tree should have your application's loaders applied. So you can say that node modules, the node modules directory, shouldn't have the loaders applied to it. But that still leaves the problem. You have this JSX file in this module. How do you make sure that that transpilation actually happens if you're not applying the loaders from the top of the tree to that module? That's where a lesser known concept in Webpack called libraries come in. It actually is something kind of like an intermediate bundle where you can prepare, you can actually run all of your loaders and output your bundle, but you can make sure that you can use um, externals to keep anything like React or any of these larger libraries outside of that bundle. And I'm going to show you how to do that at the end of the talk. But I did want to say, you know, I think it's worth examining the different solutions to this problem before we say that one is not modular. That one actually, you know, there might be pros and cons to both, but this doesn't mean that it's not modular. So now I want to talk about making these modules more modular. And this part might be a little bit, there are some uh, questionable practices that do break some things in here. So um, I will talk about those as I go along. So what about if you want to include CSS? In Webpack, you can use require. And this is one of those things where it's kind of a, an iffy practice because this does make it harder to test when you're using Node. Now, I have figured out that you can use Jest. Jest, you can actually set up a configuration and test using Node, even if you are using require for non-JS assets. Um, I don't have a slide on that, but if you're interested in that, I can show you afterwards. In Webpack, what you do in order to make this actually load is you specify a loader for CSS files. And the CSS loader will load the CSS, parse it, and then pass it to the style loader, which will inject it into the JavaScript. So this helps with that cohesion idea, because this means that your CSS is going to be delivered with your JavaScript. It's going to just be part of the bundle. That helps with cohesion. In Browserify, you can do the same thing using um, BRFS module and insert CSS. Now, that was, uh, like I said, that helps with cohesion. There's actually a feature in Webpack with CSS that helps with decoupling things, and that's local CSS. With local CSS, you put this local colon and then parentheses and the class name that you want to use, 
And what it's going to do is export a CSS file that has this base64 encoded string instead of .foo. And then when you want to use that class in your templates, you actually require styles.css and then use it as a property. So the interesting thing about this is that it actually makes it possible to decouple your CSS from different components. You know, you no longer have this global CSS where you have foo in this component and foo in this component, and they, do, they have different style rules, and those both get applied to the foo elements. Uh, because of this base64 encoded string, that's going to be unique to the component. So it's interesting. It's a newer practice, and it's worth trying out and testing out, see how it works for you. But I thought it was worth mentioning. So let's talk about images now. So we have CSS, we have our JavaScript. What about images? Both Webpack and Browserify make it possible to deliver images with your modules. So in Webpack, there are a couple of different loaders. Um, this one called the URL loader will actually create a data URL that you can insert. There's also the file loader, which if you have larger images, you'll probably want to use that one. And in Browserify, you would use BRFS again. So now we've increased our cohesion, we've decoupled things a bit. How do we actually make things reusable? How do we take this part of our tree that's below, you know, a child of our app, move it up to the same level so that other applications can start depending on it? Well, in Webpack, I talked about libraries. You can actually have in your config file um, something that will make it possible for you to output a library. And this library can be used not just by other people that are working with Webpack, but also people using Browserify, people using just you know, the browser, globals. So this is actually an interesting way to make it accessible and more reusable to a larger group of people. You specify what the library name should be and the library target in your output. And these externals are all of the things that should not be included in the bundle for this library. For Browserify, um, try standalone and exclude. I myself have actually not played around with doing a library in uh, Browserify because Browserify, um, if you are working with other Browserify projects, they do allow those transforms. So I haven't played with this myself. But um, I'm sure that there are people in the audience who have. So th this is one that I would uh, give a shot if you're trying to make it reusable across different bundling tools. So let's review. So we saw how you could increase cohesion and reduce coupling by including your CSS and your images in front end modules, and how you could increase your reusability by using libraries. If you have any more, if you want to explore these things any deeper, here are some resources that I used in preparing this talk. And thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, that was thank lovely. You. All right, Lynn, okay, <laughs> so what's the last song you listened to? I think it was probably uh, Prince's Kiss. Okay, okay, come on over here. Sure. We'll continue this convo. <laughs> um, if you had a boat, do you have a boat? I do not own a boat. Okay, so if you had a boat, <laughs> what would you name it? Oh gosh, I don't, um, Queen Mary. Okay, why? Because that's the only boat name I can think of right okay, now. Okay, perfect, perfect. Historical figure you'd like to have coffee with? Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, why don't you live in New York City? Because my mortgage is $750 a month, people. Wow, I don't understand wow. why you pay what you pay. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>